Hi everyone and welcome to the DataFam Community Jam. I'm Sarah Bartlett, I'm a Tableau Zen Master and a Social Ambassador and I'm helping to organise this series of events. The DataFam Community Jam events are co-sponsored by the Tableau Fringe Festival and Tableau themselves. We heard that people in the community were craving connection, they missed attending in-person user groups and they missed talking about Tableau to their colleagues at work. So we created this series of events to connect virtually but also to help people make connections in the community. We have an amazing lineup for you today, um, but before we get to that, I'd like to give a big shout out to all of the TFF organizing committee, including Emily Kund, Lorna Brown, Kevin Flerledge, and Alex Wolchek, and of course, Jordan Scott from Tableau. Thank you so much for all of your help behind the scenes. It's been really exciting to bring this event to life. Just a few logistics before we get started. Our presenters are going to present for approximately 20 minutes each. We have a total of four speakers at uh, today's event. At the end of each talk, we'll take one question from the Q&A live. Now you may see some new functionality in Zoom that you've not seen before. So in the Q&A section, uh, you have the ability to like a question in the Q&A. Now we'll look at the questions and we'll pick the one with the most likes to answer live. For the rest of the questions that are in the Q&A, we'll, the speakers will answer those during the next talk. Now, if your question isn't answered today, don't worry. We will look at the questions after the event and get back to you with the answers. Now, without further ado, our first presenter today is Jonathan Drummy. Jonathan is one of the original Zen Masters and has been inducted into the Zen Master Hall of Fame. He's blogged extensively and presented on the fundamentals of Tableau countless times. Jonathan is currently a data visualization specialist at PATH, where he provides technical assistance, training, and capacity building in data biz for improving global health. Prior to joining PATH, Jonathan was the lead trainer and a consultant at Datablick and a volunteer on the Visualize No Malaria Partnership that includes Alteryx, Exasol, Mapbox, PATH, the Tableau Foundation, and the Zambia Ministry of Health. Over to you, Jonathan. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to share my screen here and welcome everybody, uh, especially those from points west where it's even earlier in the morning. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Sarah and Lorna and Kevin and all the organizers of this for putting this together, especially in this time. Um, having community is virtually is a really wonderful thing. And for those of you who are under different stresses in your life from this pandemic, uh, thanks for making the time today and being here, and I hope to make it worth your while. So I'm going to talk about uh, what makes a mark here. Sarah did a great intro, so I'm going to skip over this except to say that PATH is a, we're a nonprofit organization working on things like COVID-19, uh, as a disaster response in a way, but also a lot of our work is about health system strengthening. So we're still working on malaria elimination and HIV control and all these other projects while we're also trying to respond uh, to the current pandemic. So it's, uh, it's an interesting time. And with that, I thought I'd do a, a more technical talk and talk about what makes a mark because I'm helping regularly helping other users and seeing um, things that come up. So marks are the core elements of data visualization. So I just grabbed uh, one of the featured views on Tableau Public here from Philip Quanning. And as we're looking at it, we can see we've got countries here in different colors, and then we have some different shapes and lines on here. So those are translating those values from our data into these visual elements. Um, so the marks are the bars, the line segments, the map regions, and so on in our visualizations. And in Tableau, switching over to Tableau here to do a little demo of this. So, um, so I want to show my sales by category and subcategory. I've got some of sales out here as a measure. And down in the lower left, I'm seeing just one mark in the view. Tableau has aggregated all of my data into one mark. And then when I add category and drag that to rows, now I see three marks, one for each category, that status bar updates. If I add subcategory here, I'm out to 17 marks. So the dimensions that I'm adding in the view are changing the marks that I'm showing. So our first definition of what makes a mark is the combination of dimensions on rows, columns, pages, and the marks card. But this being Tableau, 
there's a little more going on here um, with that. So let's switch to our next demo. So now I want to add a couple of measures and so, so, excuse me, show some additional things. So let's do profit by region. Uh, so let's take out profit, drop it on here. Now I have profit, I have two marks cards, and now I'm up to 34 marks. So I have a set of marks for sum of sales, a set of marks for sum of profit. On this marks card, I'm gonna add region onto color. And now I'm up to 85 marks in my view. So I've added another dimension just to this marks card. It's increasing my number of marks. I've also created a measure. Um, for my sales that have a positive profit. Uh, sorry, my calculation window went all the way over here. So I'm gonna drag that out as another measure. And now I'm up to 102 marks. My mark count's grown even more. And then I'll add sales with negative profit onto a dual axis here. Tableau's giving me an extra measure name spell and I'll just color that on my measure values card. And so now I have measure values as well. So our next definition of what makes a mark, adding up a little here, it's the combination of dimensions and measure names on rows, columns, and pages, and marks card for each of our marks cards as a more complex definition. And the total number of marks that we can see is that combination of the status bar and the nulls indicator. Another way we can see that is if we go in and I'll just do a view data. So I'm looking at the summary of all the marks in the view and here we can see we've got 119 rows of that, which is that 114 marks plus the five nulls. Now there's one more bit we need to add to what makes a mark on here. So here I'm gonna switch data sources uh, for this. So I have a set of software cases here. Um, so there's thousands of cases that users have submitted and I wanna see in my view, I wanna see my case durations um, uh, and my average case durations. So I've created a case duration days dimension here so I can see all of my case durations. And I'll just drag this, drop this on columns. Oops, lost my title. Let's just put this on columns, put the title back in the right place. So now I'm seeing 127 marks on the view, which doesn't quite jive right because I know I have thousands of cases. And if I add an average line and drop that on table, my average is showing up as 153 days of duration. And that just doesn't work. These are my priority one cases and I know we're on this and solving it. So this is a place where knowing some about our data is useful in understanding what we're looking at. So there's something not working right here on the view. And uh, because of this additional concept here, um, of our dimensions. And so sometimes what we can end up doing with this is we'll be hunting around in Tableau on this and be like, okay, well, I don't want case duration as a dimension here. I re really want it to be a measure so I can see the average. And boom, there's my 4.2 days as my average. So that's right, but I'm only seeing one duration here that's the average across everything. And then I start hunting around in Tableau and I find this analysis menu and aggregate measures. And I turn this off and now I'm seeing 7,737 marks with an average duration of my cases of 4.2 days. So I'm getting the view that I want using analysis aggregate measures. So here, we have this kind of final definition of what makes a mark. It's the combination of our dimensions and measure names on rows, columns, pages, and the marks card for each marks card, plus that analysis aggregate measure setting. And the thing to know is this looks like case dura duration days is a dimension, we've disaggregated it. But even when it's off, our measures and dimensions are still measures and dimensions, so in this screenshot here of right clicked on case duration days and we can still see this is a measure even though I've disaggregated the view. And this is something that I don't recommend 
because it's often very confusing to people who are coming to the view. And there's another way to think about this, which is to use the viz level of detail. So if you've built out level of detail expressions and things like that, you're already familiar with this. So the viz level of detail is the combination of dimensions on rows, columns, pages, and the marks card for each marks card. So we don't care about measure names, we don't care about the analysis aggregate measures. And we can think about viz level of detail as a range from finer and coarser Um, uh, and, um, so we can go, sorry, being distracted by stuff in the chat here. So at the coarsest level, we've got one mark summarizing all of our data. And at the finest level, we're seeing a mark for each record and our viz level of detail is somewhere in that range as we go. And then we can change that based on changing the dimensions in the view. And so to understand that finest grain and how to get that, we need to know the grain of our data. So switching back to Tableau. So in finding the grain of data, the quickest way that I've found to do this is I'm gonna take number of records and drop it on color. So Tableau is telling me there's 7,737 records. And I can drop a dimension on here. So I'm gonna drop like case owner on this. And I can instantly see that there's between one and 761 records for each of my case owners. Um, so that is not the grain of the data. There's this. So one of the ways we can look at this is to inspect the data. So I just clicked on the view data button here on the dimensions window. And we can see case owner and their subject and things like that, potentially use those. But there's also this handy case ID that looks pretty unique. So I'll do that. Instead, just replace case owner with case ID. And now some number of records is one for each of my dimensions. So I don't have to scroll down through this. I know I've got 7,737 7, rows, 7,737 marks. And with this, I can go back to this view um, that I had aggregated. Oops, I finished out the demo here where I have my average case duration and drop case ID on detail. And now I have 7,737 marks. I have that 4.2 average and this view is really discoverable in the sense that anybody looking at it can see it's broken down by priority and case ID and we're computing the average case um, duration for each of our cases. So the idea here is think about our data and we're using dimensions to set that level of detail for our marks. We're making the views easier to understand and it also makes table calculations and level of detail expressions simpler to build and configure. So I'll do a demo of that now. So here I've built out a simple cross tab, uh, sorry, scatter plot with sales and profit by subcategory and I'm computing the percent of total sales in each of our subcategories. Now I wanna color the marks by each category. And when I do that, my percent of totals immediately change. So I'll just go back here. Copiers was at 6.51%. I'll go forward, add that subcategory, add that category to color and I get 17.8%. So it broke. Now I can go in and edit my table calculation compute using to deal with that, but I'm gonna to have to do that basically every time. Um, and that's kind of a pain. So another way we can think about this is going back to our viz level of detail. We've added a dimension, we've changed that viz level of detail. And in this case, that added dimension is also added to the partitioning of the table calculation. And our source solution here is to not add dimensions, but instead add measures. So I'm gonna just duplicate this view as a cross tab to make this a little more easy to see. And so now I have my category, my subcategory, and all of my measures. I'm just putting category here so we can see it. And I'll drag out another version of category. And I can actually take this and I can aggregate it. So I can do a min aggregation. 
So I'm going to get the minimum category in each category and subcategory. I can drag out this and do attribute, which is another aggregation. And I can totally remove category as a dimension. So I don't actually need category as a dimension to set that viz level of detail. I can aggregate my dimension here. So with this, going back to our viz level detail view, we're changing that viz level detail by changing the dimensions in the view, but the measures aren't changing that viz LOD. So as long as we can get some dimensions to set our viz LOD to what we need to get our calculations right, we can aggregate the rest. And now going back to Tableau and my demo here, Instead of using category as a dimension, I'm just going to use attribute as an aggregation. And now I get that 6.51% that I'm expecting to see with that. Um, so connecting points on lines is another situation that we run into, where here I have a data set and my points of different samples, and I have some test results that we're not in the data. If I view data, I can see I've got some nulls there and my lines are not connecting. And sometimes you read like, oh, use a continuous field and your lines will connect. I've got a continuous dimension here. The lines aren't connecting because they have those null test results. So there's a couple of solutions to this. One of them in this case is let's look at that total viz level of detail in all remarks. Let's just get rid of those nulls. And on the nulls indicator in the lower right that we have here, I can click on that, filter the data, boom, the lines connect. We have another way we can do that. So same view again. If I right click on that sum of test result and go to format, on the pane tab, there's a special values for nulls and what we do with them. And for the marks, right now it's showing at the indicator. So it's showing at, that test sequence number and test series, I'm gonna change this to hide connect lines. So it's skipping those nulls and zooming right over them and connecting our lines. So again, we're thinking about that viz level of detail and is it matching? So in this case, we're filtering marks out on the first example, or we can use a special Tableau feature to connect those lines. So vanishing mark annotations uh, for the next one. So this is something that happens regularly with mark annotations. We build out a lovely view. We've got a couple of mark annotations on here and everything. And then I want to break it out between my central region and the other regions. So I've got a calculated field that I've built for this. And I drop that on color, for example, and boom, my annotations are gone. And the reason why they're gone is that on our two views here, we've changed that viz level of detail. We've added dimension to the view, and so we have new marks. And so the solution for this, a little more complicated, but what we're going to do here is instead of um, using this as a dimension, I'm gonna have a parameter of show my central region parameter. And then I have a dimension that sets up to do that. So I'm gonna drop this on here. So I have all of my values and then in the view, and then I'm going to add my mark annotation just to this one, uh, just one of them for time. And now I can change this to yes, and no, and my annotation sticks around because I haven't changed what this mark is. Now my colors aren't quite what I want and everything, so I'm just gonna move this to detail. So it's still part of the viz LOD. And then I have a color version of the dimension, which just happens to be the same. But in this case, I'm gonna put this on color as, and notice I added it as a dimension. My annotation went away. I'm gonna bring in it as an aggregation and that stays. So now I can do yes and no and my annotation sticks around.
So we're building the view at the finest grain with our calculated dimensions. And so we're adding new marks as needed and we're keeping the values for the original marks the same. And we're gonna use this again in the next few things. So we're not adding any new dimensions, we're just adding new values and aggregating for effect. Uh, so I'm gonna skip over this one for time on, actually, I'll just very quickly go through this one. Um, so here I have a view where I've got my segment sales and I have a customer list and I wanna be able to exclude those customers because they might be outliers or in this case, I know like Alan Schoenberger, he's just never gonna be a customer anymore. I want him off the list. And I have this list here, but isn't, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just right click on a mark and exclude? So I'm gonna right click and exclude Alan Schoenberger. And nothing happened in the view here and the customer name isn't actually filtered out. So why is this? So if I go to the view and look at this and I'm looking at my fields on the filter shelf, I have this exclusions customer name and filter segment and I'll show this. And here's Alan Schoenberger corporate. So that exclude is using all of my dimensions in the view. It's using customer name and segment to generate that. So the solution here for this is let's not have the view have all of these dimensions in it, but instead we're gonna aggregate segment. So I'm gonna make this an attribute. Let's go back to my demo here. So here's Alan Schoenberger again. I'm gonna exclude him and the bar moves. We're now at 10,943 and there he is on the excluded list. So we're kind of having to really think about what are those dimensions in our view. And ultimately what pills we get on filters and so on out of that. Um, so last two little demos here. So in this one, I've got a view with year of order date and I wanna use my handy little, I wanna have animations on here. So I've got format animations turned on and I'm gonna expand out my year to the quarter, but I don't have any animation. It's just bumping in and out here. And this is no good. And for this, the reason why again is we've changed our viz level of detail and ultimately we have new marks on the view. We went from year in the first view to quarter in the second view. These are different pills or different active fields depending on your terminology. So we have new marks. So animation is introducing this, this thing called a mark ID, which is using all of our dimensions from the viz level of detail except dimensions on pages. So we have two different dimensions here. When we're changing that dimension, we have a new dimension. It's giving us new mark IDs. So therefore we get no animation. So the solution for this is to use a single dimension that's changing the values of that. So back in this next view on this, I have a parameter that's letting me choose my date level and then a calculated field, which is doing the same thing with the order date as our hierarchy expansion. But then with this, as I click on my parameter and I go to year to quarter to month, I get my animation because I haven't changed my dimensions in the view, I'm just changing the values. And now for the last demo on this, which is another subtlety with animations and marks. Here I've got two views. Um, they both have the same animation settings, but there's different ways we've built them. So right now I'm showing all the regions and I'm gonna click on my parameter to collapse the regions. And in the view on the right, what we saw is all of those lines kind of smoothly merged together into an original line. On the left, I'll expand it out and we can see this kind of crossfade effect where the new lines appear over the original while the original goes away. And I'll go back and forth over this a couple of times just to see that again. So the way we end up with this particular effect is that in this view, when I'm showing just the one region, I only have four marks. And then when I show all regions, 
I'm going to 16 marks. So I'm actually changing my marks along the way. And in that case, what Tableau is doing is it's fading out the all mark and fading in all of the other marks. Whereas on my smooth animation, I have region and year on here. There are 16 marks in the view at this point. And if I click on no, I still have my 16 marks here. So Tableau is able to move those 16 marks together. I'll make it a little more obvious. I'm just gonna select all four marks that are kind of hidden here and expand this out and we can see those moving. So this requires a little more setup um, in terms of I had to aggregate my color here and then also I needed a calculated field for the region animation. And there was a t talk at TC19 that also went through this on building this out. So that's a little more work. So as I was saying, we have our completely new values are entering, the disappearing values are exiting. So our solution is to draw all those marks in the initial view so we can move them and get that nice smooth animation. So last review here. So making a mark, all of our dimensions and measured names across rows, columns, pages, and marks card for all of our marks card and analysis aggregate measures. That's how we can count up all of our marks. For our viz level of detail, we're just looking at those dimensions. And then for mark IDs and animations, we're ex excluding those dimensions on pages. So hopefully this is useful to you as you're building out different views, trying out different things, explaining some odd little bits of Tableau behavior. And uh, thanks for watching. And now I will take a question. Hey, Jonathan, it's Lana. Great talk. Um, I really appreciate you doing this for us. Um, two quick questions. The first okay. one is, can you show us where you um, do the number of marks, please, in the view? Because it was slightly cut off on our screens. Okay. So if you uh, can share that with Tableau, please. All right, sorry about that. So let me, can you guys see it now? Yes, we can down see here in the lower left. Yep. So we have this four of 16 marks down here, this marks counter. And this is one of my most, as I'm building views that I'm trying to get really specific effects in, um, and I'm looking at data densification, things like that, I am constantly looking at this to see what's going on. It's just super useful. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And then the question here from Valerie Weller, um, can Jonathan expand on the uses for anal analysis aggregates? Because they've never Marks. used it. Okay, so my first advice is don't use it, if you can. <laughs> um, and the reason why, so the thing that Tableau does is it puts an awful lot of the controls for building a view right here. So our dimensions and our measures, we're dropping them on our shelves. We can look at a view and see what's going on. The lesser used stuff Tableau sticks up into menus, like aggregate measures and mark stacking, for example. Um, but if I turn this off or on, I'm just going to turn it off in this one, then that setting is not visible to users. So in this way, so this is why I don't recommend it is because I'll come back to this view later and I'll be like, how did I get all these marks here? What's going on? I don't get it. Um, so it's not as useful that way. So the only time that I will use analysis aggregate measures off is when I don't have some sort of unique record ID field in my data or set of fields that give me a record ID. Um, so, so it's only when I have to, otherwise I'm putting the dimensions on detail or other shells that I need to get the marks that I need for the view. Perfect. Thank you, yeah. Jonathan. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, there is a few other questions um, in the chat. Can, so can I add, could... I'll add one more thing to that. Sure. Um, this is also one of those things for those of you who are coming to Tableau from, uh, from the stats world like R or Python or things like that. Um, there's a, a different way that Tableau works that's important here. So one of the things that we can see is Tableau, as I'm um, having a view and adding fields, Tableau is always aggregating my data. 
So Tableau is kind of aggregation first, whereas if I'm using our data frames or Python pandas data frames and so on, fundamentally we're working row by row in those. And even though we can interact as a vector and things like that, we're still working row by row. And so we don't even care, think about row IDs or things like that because the tool is automatically giving us it to them. So I see a lot of stats people using the analysis aggregate measures setting to get that level of detail that they're expecting to see. Um, so it is useful. It is there to make life easier and kind of flow more with Tableau. My suggestion is use some set of dimensions, like we have a row ID in Superstore that I can unhide and drop on detail, and then I can see all of that data. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So I'm sure. just going to steal the screen from you. Yep. I can stop sharing. And I will answer some questions in the chat. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Thank you all. So next up, we have Daria Voronova um, from the Toronto Tableau user group, which is in Canada for those that don't know, just in case. Um, Daria has been working as a Tableau reporting developer for several years across uh, the retail and advertisement industries. And she's worked with clients to help organize self-service analytics environment and train users on how to use Tableau reports as a data exploration tool. Daria, are you ready? I am. Perfect. So if you could share your screen, that would be awesome. Cool. Hello, Anna. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so guys, hi, everyone. Three quick facts about me. So I love yoga, hikes, and Tableau. Well, so now um, I'm going to pause and share my professional experience. Um, so essentially, yeah, I've been working uh, as a Tableau reporting developer across the retail and advertisement industries. And so literally a month ago, I decided to set up a company and um, turned my attention towards becoming a trainer, inspiring uh, users on how to use Tableau as a core tool to reveal uh, insights and tell a story behind their data. Well, um, so now um, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my personal um, experience on how I ended up today here. So only just because today we have like really cool circle of folks. <laughs> so honestly, I was always thinking of where to connect with like-minded folks who are passionate about data visualization in Tableau. And so here's the thing. So I'm not super active on social media and um, <laughs> Here's the thing. So, uh, like that, actually, the thought that the largest um, community is actually on Twitter has never crossed my mind. I know, I know. Um, so, literally one month ago, I decided to set up my account on Twitter, and um, well, I got introduced to the community. So, I started reaching out to people. I started asking for um, Zoom meetings. Um, so I started introducing myself, my work, and honestly, guys, I was so surprised with how our um, Tableau community members were willing to share their knowledge and experience. And here, honestly, I just really want to call out a couple of names. Thank you so much, Kevin Flourish and Jeff Schaefer for, and a bunch of other Tableau superstars for, um, who were willing to share their knowledge and advice. Gosh, honestly, I feel like I'm at the Oscars. Well, anyway, so honestly, my message is here to everyone who starts their journey uh, on Tableau or in the community. Guys, never underestimate the value of connecting with like-minded folks. Reach out to people, um, ask for Zoom meetings, ask for advice and suggestions on the work you do. Um, connect, learn, and share. I guess that like together we grow. Our community is not about competition. It is about sharing, learning, and inspiring each other. So that is personally where I find inspiration and energy. And to me, that is the power of our community. Now, let's get back to my presentation. So honestly, at work, sometimes I dream how great it might be to have psychic abilities so I can predict what my clients are looking for. But here's the thing. So unfortunately, I don't have psychic abilities. So, well, I decided to try another approach, the approach that helped me 
to save so much time and energy on developing reports in Tableau. And essentially the approach is start with the right questions before you create a report. Essentially, that is what, a, what is going to save you so much time and energy on an endless back and forth process with your client trying to guess what they would like you to build on top of. Now, let's imagine a situation. So literally right now you're sitting in front of a client and let's say that is the first introduction meeting and your client might go like, uh, well, we're looking for creating a report. We can throw like a bunch of KPIs, donut charts, bar charts, whatever you think is reasonable. But over time, you get a sense that like your client does have no clue on what precisely they would like you to build on Tableau. So now that is your job to help your client to understand what they would like you to build on Tableau. How? Start with the right questions. The first question you might ask your client, who is your audience of the dashboard and what are their needs? Identify the audience. So now what actions will it take in response to these answers? Identify value. The third thing is essentially gather all possible information, identify requirements. Now, ask your clients, what would you do if you knew this information? What questions need to be answered? What value will a dashboard bring to your organization? What is the scope? Are we trying to create like a broad um, displaying uh, broad um, information, displaying um, information KPIs about the entire organization, or we're looking to focus on something specific, um, focusing on specific functions, process, and product. Now, what is the business role? Are we trying to create a strategic report uh, that provides a high level uh, and long-term view of performance, or um, we're trying to create like a focus near-term and tactical view? Now, these are all time's favorite questions of mine. So how do we measure success? How does success look like to us? So how do you understand? How do I understand if the, these numbers are good or bad? Do we have any targets, thresholds year over year or month over month? So what are the key metrics that will focus users on actionable information? So now dashboard uh, requirements template. So now you might ask why essentially do you need to gather requirements? Because essentially that is what, that is, what is going to help you understand directionally what, where you would like to move, move forward to. So essentially dashboard requirements, here's just like a quick recap on the questions I went over uh, before. Now, everybody knows that dashboards consist of multiple views. So it is also a good practice to compile requirements for specific uh, worksheets or views. You might start with what is the overall description of this view? What is the data granularity? Are there any logical groupings, comparison between categories and segments? How does change over time look like for your client? Like, are we looking for historical data or is it going to be like a snapshot, real-time data, predictive data? And now uh, drill into what are the primary and secondary measures and dimensions. How, does, um, um, how do calculations look like? Uh, what are the filters, formatting, colors? Now, now at this point, you can stop torturing your client with asking so many questions. And essentially, now you can think of yourself as a magician or a wizard who has all the power, all the knowledge of the data to proceed forward. You might ask, what is the next step to take? Choose the right type. So um, this diagram I borrowed from uh, my personal favorite dashboard uh, that was built by Adam McCann, five types of dashboards. Here, based on your user type and the level of granularity, you might uh, choose the right type of report. And there are definitely lots of ways to look, um, um, to look at how you can categorize reports in Tableau, but essentially here are three main types uh, that I'm going to go over. So executive dashboards, they usually track key performance indicators, analytical dashboards, pro process data to identify trends, operational dashboards, tell you what is happening now. Okay, so now, now let's start. Um, let's start with, um, uh, let's start with contract overview. So essentially by the end of the presentation, you are gonna know um, who is the audience, what is the focus, what is the application, and what are the conceptual and visual templates, and what are the showcases for each and every type of the report. Awesome.
let's start with executive dashboards. Well, so essentially executive dashboards are usually, who are they for? So usually they are for executives. They usually focus on overall state of the business. So the level of granularity is high level metrics and they usually process um, monitor progress to target year over year or month on month comparison. So you might ask what they are good for. They are good for providing quick what, where, and when information that others then will go act on. But they are not good for providing quick, more complex why and how questions. Uh, conceptual template. So essentially the main components of executive dashboards might be current value, target value, progress to target, historical trends year over year and month over month change. Now, visual vocabulary. Um, visual vocabulary is super useful when it comes down again to identifying which type of report you're gonna build on Tableau because that is something that is going to help you so much time uh, because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Once you know what is the right type of report for um, that suits best to your needs and no visuals, what are the visuals might work well. You don't have to spend so much time on, you know, like designing like super <laughs> elaborated visuals, although you might. Anyway, so visual vocabulary. Um, having said that executive dashboards usually focus um, on like really high level, uh, broad information and uh, introducing like high level KPIs, it is always good to focus your users on main KPIs with big numbers. So progress to target. Uh, you can always uh, show, for example, the current value as a bar and as a GAN bar target. So show, show progress to target. Um, target achieved, um, donut charts, don't get me wrong. Uh, change over time, historical data, magnitude. Awesome, visual template. So here is one of the possible ways how you can uh, show information for executive uh, in uh, executive dashboards. So essentially this template shows you that you can put, for example, the actual KPIs performance as a bar, then progress to target as a Gantt bar and um, some historical data, for example, this year um, and last year information, current performance, previous period performance and change over time. Now, that is uh, one of the best reports I've ever seen uh, built by uh, Andy Kribel, uh, probably one of the uh, most well-known um, Tableau evangelists um, in the community. So essentially that is how you can apply um, the previous template executive dashboard to different, in this case, um, uh, teams, channels, uh, like divisions, um, groups, segments, whatever you might think of. So. Now let's consider some showcases. So let's say for example, your client is a small company in the retail industry. So um, the head of the company is missing, is missing a picture of the overall uh, performance of the company. And so the problem is that there is no centralized place to look at broad organizational KPIs in a single view. So the challenge, you are asked to create a report for the CEO that takes literally 20 seconds to understand which metrics are below or above the target. So the head of the company can quickly address the issue uh, to a corresponding department. All time favorite dashboard uh, built by Adam McKinn. So Superstar Weekly Executive Dashboard. Here, it takes like literally 10 or 20 seconds to understand which KPIs are exceed a target or uh, which, tar uh, which KPIs uh, exceed a target uh, with the blue color and essentially which of them missed uh, the target. So now let's skip to analytical dashboards. Who are they for? They are for business and data analysts. They usually focus on specific segment and monitor a key metric at a glance. And most importantly, they allow you to drill into why. So level of granularity, we can see that it is top to bottom level metrics. Um, historical, uh, they monitor historical data and seasonality. So they are good for exploratory analysis. So answers why and how this is happening. But they're not good for providing uh, a, comp a comprehensive view of complex organizations. Now, visual vocabulary you might apply. So 
you can always show magnitude. Comparison, for example, you can show for specific regions and segments year over year, month over month growth. Ranking, correlation between two or more variables, dimensions. Correlation between measures, bar to whole. Now, what might be, uh, what might work as a conceptual template? So essentially here, having said that analytical dashboards um, uh, might serve as a self-exploration tool for your user, start with show KPIs for a specific segment. So like put on your lot up left upper corner, um, what, like show KPIs for specific segments, show whether there are like any red flags. If there are any red flags, show where and when, show time and location, when and where this is happening. Drill into uh, why and allow your user to explore. The next uh, logical question is why, what is causing the problem? Drill down and explore. And the last one is essentially a call to action. Knowing what is causing the problem, what is the next step to take? Now, showcase. Um, your client is a regional manager. So the showcase might be as approaching the end of last year, the profit target was missed for a region. And the client doesn't have any single place to drill into what was causing the problem. Now, you were asked to create a dashboard that allows the user to drill into why and what is causing a low profit or a region. Well, that, uh, this dashboard um, is, I believe, a little bit better in uh, interactive uh, version. You can always check um, it on Tableau Public. So essentially, left upper corner, what regions haven't met the profit target in last year? Um, so West region didn't meet the profit target. Now, the, uh, the next step, where the profits target haven't been met, essentially show, um, show specific states. Um, the next logical question is, okay, so now we know in which region, we know, uh, we know in which states the profit, the profit target um, hasn't been met. Um, so now when was the most significant year over year drop in profit? Now we know the time. And so the final question is, which of the distribution centers show the drop in profit so we can understand directly who we need to contact to, to fix the problem. So here we can see that we start with a broad in, uh, organizational information. We see uh, in which regions we didn't meet the target. Now we drill into states, then when, and the most granular data distribution centers. Okay. So the final is operational dashboards. Operational dashboards are for analysts, middle management. Um, they focus on catching red flags, KPIs performance on an hourly and daily basis within a department. So the level of granularity is the most granular data you have um, and they monitor current activity. So now operational dashboards are good for identifying specific issues that require immediate action or fix but they're not good for seeing a comprehensive view of organization or like uh, showing organizational broad KPIs. Now, visual vocabulary. Having said that operational dashboard usually uh, focus on the most granular data, it is always a good practice to show um, hourly trends, weekly trends, heat maps, uh, one of the best ways to show um, uh, daily or, or hourly patterns. Now, progress to target if, for example, you have specific targets on a daily or weekly basis. So bring it all together. Amazing um, visualization, I guess, uh, and decreable has designed that. Um, and just later on, I'm gonna showcase how these visuals work um, together. So a conceptual template. Uh, essentially, you can show overall state for a week, then drill into hourly and daily performance. Um, answer whether like there are any critical issues, what is causing the problem, drill down and explore. And the final step of your operational dashboard, again, might be call to action, knowing what is causing the problem, what is the next step to take. Now let's consider a showcase. So let's say that your client is a T support team. The team doesn't have a single uh, report to track an overall volume of the tickets, which is causing the overload at work. Now, your client ask you, uh, asks you to um, create a dashboard 
that monitors the volume of tickets on an hourly, daily, and weekly basis. There are essentially two goals. The first one is um, to track the overall team performance, how many resolved, unresolved tickets, how many tickets are with critical or major status, so the team can address tickets accordingly. Uh, and the second task is essentially to optimize uh, the teamwork and resources by, based on the most busiest time during um, a day or week. So the tickets with, crit with a critical priority are addressed and resolved immediately. Now, um, here, uh, this amazing dashboard uh, was built by MD. And um, so essentially here we're seeing weekly tickets performance. Uh, ticket uh, ticket uh, volume, so essentially we understand how we're progressing towards the end of the week. Uh, we know what are the major and critical tickets, how many, and uh, the, uh, the current state of open tickets. Uh, and the bottom part shows um, the tickets priority. So we know which tickets should be addressed um, um, immediately. Now, answering the second question, how we can properly resource our team. In order to do that, first of all, we need to know what are the most busiest days and hours during a week, right? And so that is where HitMap, a HitMap works amazingly together with bar charts. So essentially here we can easily grasp that Monday is the most um, busiest day during a week. Essentially, and uh, based on um, our heat map, we can say that 4 p.m. and um, 12 p uh, 4 a.m. or 12 p.m. are the most busiest uh, hours to submit tickets. So essentially that is how we need to, um, that is when we need to uh, properly resource our team. Now, the last showcase. Um, let's say for example, your client uh, is bike rental company. Um, you are asked to track what is the busiest time during a day, week and season for bike rentals. So the client can effectively supply the transportation units according to the demand. Now, um, essentially, that is where heat map and bar chart work amazingly together. So essentially, as everybody knows, like, for example, when you are asked to show, um, let's say, 12 weeks or like really, um, um, so when it comes down to visualize uh, daily or weekly patterns, it is really hard to showcase, for example, 10 weeks and easily, easily comprehend and digest a view. So that is where you can always use um, heat maps um, to understand what are the weekly or daily patterns. So essentially here, looking at this heat map, we can easily understand that, for example, commuting hours like 8 a.m., 5 and 6 p.m. are the most busiest one. And essentially looking at this chart, we can easily understand that Thursday is actually the most uh, busiest uh, day to hire bikes. Now, the final slide is, guys, asking the right questions is going to save time, energy, resources on developing your dashboard. So the game guess what I would like to see on my dashboard is not going to happen. Thank you so much, um, Tableau Superstars. And here's my contact info. Reach out to me, always happy to chat. Thank you guys. Thank you, Daria, that was amazing. I really loved all the different examples you shared. It's gonna be super helpful for me personally. And I can see from the chat that everyone's been saying how helpful they're gonna find it as well. And um, we do have one question that, that says, how would you handle a request if someone comes to you like as such as a client and asks to have a report that looks like something that usually get in Excel, they literally just want the numbers and they're not comfortable with any visuals. What would you do in that kind of scenario? Um, so um, probably I might definitely showcase what are the possible examples to build in Tableau, um, just as an example, you know, see what is what is possible and for sure if my clients like insist on <laughs> on um proceeding with their uh, type of visual well what are you gonna do you know? <laughs> okay thank you and there's a few questions for you to answer so um daria will go through those now i'm just gonna steal the screen from you just bear with me Okay, so next up, we have Sean Davis. So Sean is a Tableau developer 
and Autoreach Developer at Tessellation Consulting. He focuses on labelling organisations who use data more effectively through development, training and strategic guidance. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Sarah. I'm really excited to present this material today and I will go ahead and share my screen while we jump into the content. Okay, can you see my screen? We can, thank you. Great, thank you. So what I'm gonna cover today are six things that are killing your dashboard's performance. And before we get into that, a little bit about myself. Um, again, as Sarah said, I'm a consultant at Tessellation Consulting. I've been developing in Tableau for five years. Um, and I'm passionate about performance. Uh, design and having a well-designed da dashboard like we saw in Daria's dashboards is really, really important, but that goes hand in hand with performance. Um, and it's often something that, that ends up limiting the use and the acceptance of your dashboard and your products that you put out. A little bit more about me, I'm based in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, I'm the leader of the Tallahassee uh, Tableau user group. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go through some weather data that is from Tallahassee. And I'm passionate about that because I'm a, um, I grew up surfing in South Florida. And if you don't know that, there is not a lot of surf in South Florida. So we are super dependent on the weather and looking at hurricanes and storms and things like that. So I grew up looking at weather models, looking at weather data. So it's something that I've always uh, looked into and always been interested in, and that's what we'll use um, to go through everything today. So first, why is performance important? Um, this is based on a uh, article called The Powers of 10 Time Scales and User Experience. Um, and you'll, I'll send out the link afterwards and include it in the workbook. What we want to do, do first is understand how fast people perceive information and how we need to design um, our dashboards so that they are um, used a ton and used um, to answer questions. So the first level that we'll look at is um, how fast users can decide to use a dashboard. So in about a tenth of a second, that's how fast we can perceive um, information and see something on a screen and really quickly decide if we want to continue to use that dashboard. Within about a second, so if we're looking at a dashboard that we've designed and it takes about a second to respond, that's how quickly your user can lose their train of thought. Um, so that this is starts to be where we can have an effect, you know, the tenth of a second that's more on the software and things like that, but um, with losing the train of thought, that's where we can start to have an effect and design products that respond that fast. Going up from that, within about 10 seconds, if somebody is waiting for your dashboard to respond um, and it takes 10 seconds or more, they're going to lose their train of, or sorry, they're going to lose their attention. So within about 10 seconds, they're going to look at Twitter, they're going to look at email, and they're going to completely forget what question they went to ask from your dashboard. And then the last one is about 60 seconds. Um, we want to design our dashboards and design our products so that people can complete their task in about 60 seconds, whether that's changing filters and things like that. So it, the, the where performance becomes important is if they're sitting there and waiting 10, 15 seconds for your dashboard to respond, every single time they're changing a filter or changing a sheet, it's going to take them a ton of time and it's going to push it beyond that 60 second time limit. When I'm designing dashboards um, and when we're consulting, these are our recommendations and where we generally try to get people. Um, we want to see a dashboard that loads within about five seconds. So when somebody clicks on it in Tableau server, it should load and show all the information and give them control within about five seconds. Um, and then it should respond to interactions, whether they be filtered parameter changes, things like that within about three seconds. One thing I'll say about this is these are goals. They're not requirements. Um, 
and you have to view performance as the entire picture. You're a lot of times constrained based on the design that your users are asking for or the data source you're using or some choices you've had to make along the way. Um, and so these are goals. There are gonna be times when you design a dashboard and you just can't get to this. But for most of your products, you wanna try and, and uh, achieve these goals. And what I'll show you today um, will help you get there. So what we'll do, um, like I said, is we will look at some weather data and we will build on this dashboard as we go throughout this and, and implement some of the things that I've talked about. So what we're trying to do is get rid of this box. And you can see we're sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting for the view to load. We're close to about 20 seconds for this um, dashboard to load. Um, and even as a presenter, my train of thought started to slip as I was sitting here watching that box and you'll have that same experience in Tableau server. So this is uh, weather data. So we're looking at temperature and humidity for the past 20 years in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, we've got a heat map up here. We're breaking it, breaking it down by humidity, the amount of precipitation, temperature, and then we've got a scatter plot doing the same thing over here with some filters. So like I said, we'll add, or sorry, we'll, we'll improve this dashboard and we'll definitely get it to um, within those performance goals that we had set out. So with that, let's jump into the six things that are killing your dashboard's performance. This is all six of them. We'll take a look at the super secret mystery one at the end, but first let's jump into grand totals. So if you are not familiar with grand totals, what they are or the way you can add them to a view is if you click on a sheet and go up here to analysis uh, and then go into totals, you can add both row grand totals and you can add column grand totals. Oops, sorry, clicked the wrong one. So we'll go back, do it again, add row and add column. And what it'll do is based on the aggregation that you're using in that view, it'll give you another row here across the bottom and across the entire table. So this is looking at um, temperature across, these are hours of the day and these are months of the year. So you can see here uh, around the one o'clock hour in, that is July, it is quite unpleasant in Tallahassee. It's an average temperature of 88 overall. Um, not too bad at a total of 68, or sorry, an average of 68. Um, but let's take a look at some of the issues with grand totals. And the way we'll go through each of these issues or each of these things that are killing your dashboard's performance is we'll look at the issues and then we'll look at three different levels of solutions. And I'll, I'll pick one of those um, and, and give you an example. So the issue with grand totals is that it adds more load time to each um, view that you're loading in your dashboard. When you have a relatively simple view or um, something that doesn't have a ton of marks like Jonathan mentioned, um, it's not that bad. But when you have a very complex view that includes things like level of detail calculations, tons of filters, um, possibly a live connection, um, it can get much, much worse. And that simple thing of adding the grand total can kill your performance. So the solutions for grand totals, the button click solution, <clears throat> the simplest solution is turn them off. Um, a lot of times I find that they don't add a ton of value and there's other ways to show that information. Our middle of the road, a little bit more effort to get to this solution is to mimic a grand total. And I'll show you how to do that. And one of our best solutions that's gonna take more time is adding KPIs or big articulated numbers to your dashboard. Let's take a look at how we can mimic grand totals. So we've got our same dashboard, or sorry, our same view here with our grand, grand totals going down the side and then our grand totals going across the bottom. What I'll do is go ahead and turn those off and show you how you can mimic them um, without adding them and using the grand total feature. So we'll go in, duplicate this sheet. And what we'll do is we'll take month off of the column shelf. And what this will do is it'll give us that same total across the entire view and we will get rid, actually we'll keep color on this and I'll change it to standard so we can see the text here. 
what we can do is we can just add what's called an ad hoc dimension at the top. And I'm just going to do quotes and call this grand total. And we'll add a title at the top of my view. Else, and we will uncheck this so we no longer see this over here. And what we'll do is we'll go back to our dashboard and we'll take that sheet that we just duplicated, add it over here, and we'll expand it so it fits the entire view, get rid of our color legend, drag it over here, get rid of our title. And what we can do is add just a blank text, a blank box, a blank container at the top. And now we can mimic that grand total. There's a little bit of formatting to get that to fit exactly. What you can also do is use the layout tab over here, double click this and get rid of any of that padding. So get rid of the padding on that side and then go over to our other sheet and get rid of the padding on the other side. And now what you've done is you've turned off that grand total feature but you've made it look like, again, there's a little bit more formatting that we can do to get that to fit exactly. Um, but you've made it look like you already have that grand total and you get, you don't have the same drag on your performance um, because you're using the aggregation features that are native within Tableau. So there's not another query running after your dashboard loads. Let's take a look at our same um, weather dashboard, but now on our heat map across the top, I've turned off our grand totals. So go ahead and click on that and we'll see what our performance is and how, uh, how much it's gone down by. So we're still getting that box. Last time you remembered, remembered it was about 20 seconds that it took to load and now we're still waiting for that scatter plot to load. Um, and it's, so now it's a little bit less. Um, and you can also see I got rid of the, down here on scatter plot, I got rid of the trend line because that's also sort of another um, uh, feature, another uh, grand total that's running along with it. Um, so let's jump into our next tip, not using an extract. <clears throat> and I'll pick up the pace here a little bit so we can get through all of our material. Um, so this is talking about um, extracts. So you can either use a live connection or an extract. Um, so when you have a live connection, your data is going to be always fresh. When you have an extract, it's going to be based on your refresh. Last time it was refreshed. Um, the database load, when you're using a live connection, every time you load that view, um, it's going to um, put a load on your database, whereas when you're using an extract, it's only going to put a load on your database when you run that extract. Workbook size with a live connection is going to be very, very small. With an extract, it's going to be quite large. Um, and so that can oftentimes be an issue. If you have a very large data source, um, oftentimes it's not even practical or feasible to create an extract. Functionality is going to be different between a live connection and an extract. With a live connection, sometimes you lose uncalculated fields and features, whereas with an extract, extract it's going to be consistent. From a functionality standpoint, um, you're, or sorry, from security, um, with a live connection, that's oftentimes a lot of situations where we see um, live connections used is you get not only the security that's implemented through your platform and also in Tableau Server, Whereas with an extract, you're just relying on Tableau server to implement your security. So our solutions for not using an extract is real simple. Create an extract. Again, in the situation where it's feasible or it works for uh, your security situation, um, the good solution, kind of our middle of the road, is to also create an extract, but there's some optimizations that you can use within that that we'll go through. And then your best solution is finding what's called a targeted data source. That's going to be something that's targeted just to the, the questions you want to answer in your dashboard and then running an extract on top of that. Let's take a look. If you haven't created an extract before, it's super simple. Tableau gives you a ton of ways and I'll show you just one of them. <clears throat> but this is our um, weather data set. Again, it's got about 400,000 records in it. So if you want to create an extract, what you can do is go in here right click on the data source. You can also go up the, to the toolbar, click on extract, 
and then we can run that extract. It'll ask me where I want to save it. I'll just say my desktop, and then we'll run that. Again, this should run in a couple seconds. So creating an extract doesn't take a ton of time, but it's going to improve your performance dramatically when you're able to use it. Now, I've added an, an extract, so our data source here for our dashboard is pointing at an extract, and let's see how much faster it gets. So now we're at about 11 seconds, maybe 12 seconds, we're getting there. We're, we're continuing to improve the performance. It's getting fast, faster as we're going through this. Our next thing that is killing your dashboard's performance is having too many fields in your data source. Let's take a look back at our weather data again. So some, some stats on this, uh, the Tallahassee weather data set has about 100 dimensions and 35 measures. Um, that's a ton. And then we've got that across 422,000 records. I can tell you from having developed and worked with this data set, it's a lot. Um, and the workbook is very, very large. Um, so it, it results in a very large data set. Um, and for what we're doing here, we're not using a ton of fields, and so we don't really um, we don't really need all of those fields. There's a ton of fields in here that I honestly have no idea what they are. Another situation where we see lots of fields is when you have a measure that is split out by dimensions. So this is our same data set, um, but I've split it out by hour, and then I have a separate measure for each month. And you'll often see this when you're bringing in data from Excel or somebody hands you some data where they've got the time going across the columns and then years or the data split out in another way. Tableau really does not like this. Um, it makes it, Tableau works really well when the data can be aggregated. Um, so when it's in column format, it doesn't like this when um, you have everything split out by month. Now, if I wanted to, do, to create a line chart from this, it would also take a really, really complicated formula to, to make this happen. And so if you have data that looks like this, take a look at a tool like Tableau Prep or um, other tools like Alteryx and see if you can pivot that data and reshape that data so that it works well within Tableau. Some of the too many fields in your data set, <clears throat> it results in very large extracts. Like I mentioned with this weather data, it's 100 dimensions, uh, 35 measures, and 400,000 400, rows. It's a big file. Um, you'll also find when you have too many fields in your data source that your extracts take forever. Um, you may get yelled at by IT because you're putting a huge load on the database, and they say, what are you doing? And then like we talked about, the measures split out by dimensions because you're limited in what you can do. Then our solutions, our button click is, I'll show you that next, is hide um, all unused, unused fields in your data source. That's a feature within Tableau. The next one is gonna be your good solution is creating that targeted data source with Tableau Prep. So taking your original data source, um, reshaping it, uh, aggregating to the level that you need, and then uh, pulling that into your, into your uh, dashboard and into your workbook. The best one is gonna be have it, having a targeted data source in your original you're in your source system. So that's gonna require working with your IT team, with your data engineers to get, um, to get that built. And so it's gonna take a little bit more effort and a little bit more time. Or if you're a one person analytics shop, it may take you building it. So that's gonna be a more sustainable solution, but it's gonna take more effort. So what we can do, uh, like I mentioned, our uh, pretty easy solution is we can hide all unused fields. So I'm gonna go back to our weather data and I'm gonna extract it again. Note down here at the bottom, there is this handy little button click that says hide all fields. And before I run that extract, I'll point out that we are only using three fields. So we're using one dimension, we're using date, and then we're using the temperature. So what we will do is we will hide all unused fields, run our extract, put it out on our desktop. And what Tableau will do is it will look across all of our sheets in our workbook that are pointing at this data source and figure out which ones we need and then just keep those. So now instead of having 100 dimensions and 35 measures, we've got two. 
and that's going to run a lot faster when it extracts um, and it's going to perform a lot better. So now let's take a look at our weather dashboard. Um, I, this one is using an extract and I hide, uh, I hid the unused fields. And so now we're getting our performance is faster and faster. Let's see how fast it goes. We're still at about 10, 11 seconds. It's going faster. Let's see what other improvements we can make to get it uh, to be even faster. The next one, showing too much data. Let's take a look at what this, how we can solve this problem. So we've got our scatter plot here and we're focusing just on this. So I've got a list of the number of marks. What we can do is use a date level calculation like this where we truncate our date and then uh, combine that with a parameter. So we've got the date level parameter here. And what we can do is we change our parameter here. What it's gonna do is it's gonna reduce the number of marks. So now instead of showing the data at um, the hour level, we're showing it at the day level. And we've effectively reduced the number of marks that we're showing from 400,000 that we started to started with. We've reduced it by 97%. And we can take that all the way up to month and reduce it by 99%. So you can include this on your dashboard and um, it will load much faster. Your users would still have access to the hour data. Um, and so it's gonna make that run much faster. One other way that you can um, reduce the number of marks in your view is you can do a calculation like this. And what it does is it's using a level of detail calculation to get the maximum year in your data set and then figuring out how many years back. So what we can do is we can say, okay, just show me this year and the year before. And so now instead of showing all 400,000, even though we're showing data at the date level, um, we've reduced it by you know a ton so we're only showing 17,000 and if we take it all the way up to month now we're just showing 24,000 out of our original 400,000 marks so let's set it to I want to see data by week let's take a look at what that looks like in our weather dashboard and see how much faster it gets but now you saw we didn't even get that box popping up so now it's loading um, almost instantaneously. We're showing just the last two years of data by week. So we're getting closer. We've got some data down here that makes a ton of sense. And then the last one, or before our super secret mystery, is talking about quick, quick filters. So quick filters, what they do, um, the issue with them is that they cause another query to run on your dashboard. And especially when you're using some of the settings like only relevant values, um, they can cause multiple queries that take a ton of time to run. Um, so our button click solution that we can do is, um, or sorry, a button click is remove those filters that we don't need um, and replace them with action filters as much as possible. Our good is gonna be looking at our data source um, changes, getting rid of some of those filters. And often when I see a dashboard for our best solution, when I see a dashboard with a ton of filters, it means we might need to um, redesign that or reevaluate it and find out what's important. And wrapping up here, now you can see our dashboard loaded really, really fast. We got rid of a, of a ton of those filters um, and now it's loading well under uh, five seconds. So let's take a look at our super secret mystery for the last tip. And it's using performance monitoring. And the reason I call it a secret is because it's been running in the background the whole time. So if you have access to these views in Tableau server, you can take a look at the administrative views, but also on your workbook, if you go over here to the help menu, there is an option here that'll say start performance recording and stop performance recording. And what I've been doing the whole time that I've been doing this talk is recording how fast each of these views loads. And what Tableau does is they include this feature. They've got a ton of great information. We'll just wait for it to load. And I'll actually go show you my contact information while we're waiting for that to load. And so then I'll load the performance recording workbook. And it'll tell you what actions um, and which sheets are taking the longest to load. So you can prioritize what those changes and improvements are. And with that, I appreciate your time. Thank you for your attention. Like they said, we will um, 
share out this information, you can also check, check out the blog post at tessellationtech.io. Thank you. What, what questions are there? Awesome. Thanks, Sean. It's great to um, actually understand some of the little details of how to improve performance. And I love your little trick of showing the performance recording at the very end. Nice touch. Um, so there's one here from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is the size of a big extract workbook in Tableau and how much megabytes may be a problem? And that one might be a bit tough to answer live. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate the challenge. Um, you know, it's really going to depend on a couple things. So if you have a workbook that's <clears throat> more than, I don't know, 100 megs, something like that, it's really going to depend on your connection and how long it takes you to upload that to Tableau server. Um, you know, if you're just storing it on your desktop, it's not a big deal. But extract size and workbook size becomes a real factor when you're trying to upload that to Tableau server. Um, there's timeout provisions, things like that. So um, it's going to depend on, on some of those circumstances and how your Tableau server is set up and how you're set up at work. Great question. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. There is a few other questions in the Q&A. So if you could just take some time to answer those for me. Sure. And Thank I you. will steal the screen. Okay, so next up and last up is the one fabulous one and only Andy Cotgreave. He is, um, Andy is a visual analytics expert who has been in, with Tableau in various roles since 2011, ranging from product consultant to social content manager. He is now Tableau's technical evangelism director. Before joining Tableau, he was a data analyst at the University of Oxford. Um, he helps people see and understand their data using Tableau's products and shares his passion for visual anal analysis and technology with his writing and speaking at conferences. And his role gives him the opportunity to work with media analysts and customers across the, all industries to help him understand the trends in visual analytics and develop their own data discovery skills. Andy, are you ready? <laughs> I am. Thank you. It was a lot easier to write that description than it was for you to read it out. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, Lorna. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, PowerPoint we can. type of screen. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, it is absolutely wonderful to be with you all. Thanks to the other three presenters. I have still, I've learned a bunch of new stuff. Uh, so today, I'm going to wrap this up with a thing about how to present data remotely, because that's what we're all doing in this uh, strange situation we're all in, which in a nutshell reduces down to a lesson on how to point. Uh, so that's going to be the next 20 odd minutes, probably less. Here's something that drives me crazy. Uh, do you remember the old world where people used to actually present live and they'd stand in front of a dashboard or a chart or something, but they'd stand stuck at their lectern and then point and say, look at this number. This is the number we changed. And then they'd point at this filter and say, this, this filter, not this filter is the one we changed. And here's a chart. You can see, look, you can see on this chart what's going on. Well, I can't see where they're pointing at. And we're now in this world where we are looking at... Um, these things in screen shares and people, I see people talking about complex uh, dashboards and creations, but not really drawing the user's eye to the right place. So that is the goal of this presentation. Uh, Lorna gave a great introduction, don't really need to add much to that other than I wrote the big book of dashboards with Steve and Jeff a few years ago. And like Jonathan Drummy, I've been using Tableau since around 2008. So we've been around a long time. It's crazy. Um, but it's been an amazing 12 year journey. Now, my motivation for this is based on sitting in thousands of meetings throughout my career and seeing great data presented, but seeing more, seeing so many examples where intelligent, passionate people let themselves down by putting data on a screen, which makes no sense to the audience. It might make sense on a laptop or with a lot of time to digest, but it's not optimized for presentation. Do you think this is important? I do. Uh, Alberto Cairo does. He wrote How Charts Lie. He says, if you're an analyst and think that there's a tired cliche soft skill, or he uses that cliche soft skill to refer to communication 
You don't understand that job. This tweet for me absolutely epitomizes the skill and requirement, the skills we need as data analysts. Communication is vital. So with that, let's think about how we present data remotely, especially in these uh, COVID-19 times. Now do uh, type questions as you go in the um, Q&A and chat window or Q&A window. I'll try, I might try and look at some of them as we go, but I'll probably get some at the end. I've got four sections to do in the next 15 minutes. Two are based on the types of data we present. The first thing we do, lots of you build dashboards and we present these on a screen. Now, two rules of thumb. First of all, you might have poured hours and hours into a dashboard and think it's the best thing ever. When an audience sees it for the first time, they're looking at, in this case, about 95 different pieces of information. They have no idea what to look at and what to focus on. So your goal is to draw attention to each area you discuss as you raise it in your presentation, which, as I said, is about how to point because when we go back to face-to-face -to -face meetings, do not do this. Don't do it. The only person in a room who can see what you're pointing to is you. Everybody else is left, not understanding. But we can do this uh, on our laptops extremely well. If you have a Windows, uh, uh, desktop, a Windows PC or desktop or laptop, you can turn on the control key. So here I'm saying, look, this red KPI indicates the, uh, the KPI is underperforming. These red dots indicate which categories are causing the problem. This is a setting you can change permanently in Windows. Go to Mouse Properties, Pointer Options, and show the location of your pointer when I press the control key. And then you're set up for life. You can just use the control key to show people what they're doing. Uh, laser pointers clearly are useless uh, when presenting remotely, but you might be able to see I'm holding this awesome piece of kit here. This is uh, called a Logitech Spotlight. And it allows me to do this on the screen. So I can draw your attention to the KPI that is underperforming. See the red dot. These categories are the ones that are underperforming. And this chart is the one we've changed. This filter is now working. It's brilliant for remote presentation because I can draw your eye to any particular part of the screen. And if I want, it's just another click to zoom in and let's have a look at that filter and see what the words say. This seriously has been about the best $100 I've spent in my presenting career. Uh, really cool piece of kit that works remotely as well as uh, when we go back to presenting face to face. Uh, finally, something you can do is use shapes and call outs. I found this a really effective way of doing things. Uh, let's do the same thing. This is the KPI that is not on the target. These red dots indicate which categories are causing the problem. Here's a new chart we added and this filter we changed because it was broken or whatever the story is. The reason this is a very effective way for how to point is that one of the other reasons about one of the other challenges we have as data presenters is we're short of time. And sometimes you might have time to think about your script in total detail so you've got it learned completely. Well, by having one, two, three, four uh, arrows appear in sequence, that kind of creates your script without needing to fall back on bullet points or too much text on your screen. So there you go. We all have to promote point uh, in different ways. And I think remote, when we're doing this remotely, we can consider different ways of drawing attention to the right area as we discuss it. Next up, we are gonna be presenting data remotely to try and persuade or inform or make people make decisions or tell people what happened. Um, this chart here is actually based on a real chart I saw every single month for many years in Tableau marketing meetings and every month the presenter would say, this chart shows, as you can see, blah, 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 blah. And every month I would be like, I can't. It's not a bad chart, but it's not good enough for a presentation. So as we think about these charts, we've got to consider how complex should a chart be that we're going to present remotely? Well, here's a scatter plot with 180 different marks. Is this too complex for a presentation? Some of you may think yes. Some may think no. Uh, well, this actually shows life expectancy and uh, uh, fertil uh, female fertility, and it's the scatter plot that Hans Rosling uses in his first TED talk in 2006, and then some of the documentaries he did subsequently after that. Uh, if you have not watched this video, and we'll share this link uh, with the recording, go and watch this video. And if, even if you've watched it before, go and watch it again. 
Hans Rosling was an absolute master storyteller at presenting and introducing data, and we can all learn a huge amount from him. Uh, the one takeaway I think I'll focus on in this talk is that you can show complicated charts, but you cannot assume your audience will have a clue what they're looking at. So if you want to show complexity, think about a mantra of a chart must be understandable in under half the time it is on the screen. So if you want to add complexity, you need to think, how am I going to build things piece by piece so that the audience comes along with me and understands the chart? Uh, here's a really good example from uh, ABC News in Australia. Uh, so this is scrolling pretty fast, but it's a data journalism piece introducing the concept of uh, epidemics and pandemics. You know, with COVID-19, we've had to become experts at exponential growth and logarithmic scales. And what this piece does, which if you go and scroll it a little bit slower, is introduced piece by piece so that when you get to the final chart, which is extremely complicated, you actually know what you're looking at. Imagine just dumping this chart on a screen in a presentation and then talking about what it's showing. You would never do that. Or I hope you wouldn't because I do, do see, I see that all the time with people introducing complex charts. Uh, here's another example. This is, a, this is what a chart I presented in uh, Tableau's If Data Could Talk series last week. You can find that on most of our social channels. And I was talking about this chart about um, outcomes of COVID-19 cases uh, back from March. Uh, it's a chart from the CDC. But this is how I introduced the chart. I said, okay, we've got an x-axis showing age. There are seven different categories on the x-axis of different uh, age bands. On the y-axis, we're showing the number of cases across three different categories from zero to about 140. And those three different cases are this. The light blue represents hospitalizations, dark medium blue is intensive care admissions, and the dark blue is deaths. Uh, so now here's the entire chart. And when you look at a chart like this, you'll ten you tend to respond to length. That's the first thing you probably look at from a pre-attentive attribute perspective. What do you see? You see that these two bars were the longest and they actually represent the age groups 20 to 44, 65 to 74. You might make a conclusion that younger people are at risk. Well, they are at risk, but that age band is a 20, the, the younger one is a, the age size of that, of 20 to 44 is 25 years and the other one is 10 years. So they aggregated the young people together. The point of the story of how I developed the church, developed that story in the presentation isn't what I'm trying to talk about here. I'm just hoping you can see that if you build a chart piece by piece, then your audience will bring, your audience are coming along with you and understanding what you're seeing. In other words, you know, when we're thinking about how to point, use arrows to tell people where to look. So that's persuading or informing building it piece by piece in PowerPoint. How about how can we how we can do this in Tableau? So I'm just going to switch to Tableau and show a workbook. This was built by Ben Jones, uh, now ex Tableau, now of dataliteracy.com. And it's taking the data that Hans Rosling used and it tells a really nice story by incorporating parameters and animation and some calculations. So it's a little bit complicated, but you can download this from Ben's site. So I want to tell you a story about life expectancy and how that and urbanization and how that's changed over time. What I'm going to do is introduce all the countries. Uh, on the X axis, we've got life expectancy at birth. This is Cambodia, terribly low life expectancy in 1976. And at the top of the scale, Iceland, some nearly 77 year old life expectancy. Now the Y axis shows urban population size. And we can see here we've got Djibouti, uh, nearly 70% urbanization and a kind of a, um, the, there's a fairly clear visual pattern uh, relating to life expectancy and urban populations. We can add color and color the uh, dots by region in the world. This is Iceland, pretty high on both the scales. And finally, size it by population. And what jumps out? Well, China down here, high, most populous country in the world back in 1976 and even today. And now I can begin to play this out and we can see how this changes over time. And off you go play the thing. What I hope you're getting there is a sense that I'm introducing the X, I'm introducing the dots, the marks, I'm introducing the X axis, then I'm introducing the Y axis, then bringing them together, adding color. I'm adding one piece 
piece by piece so that you as the audience aren't just presented with a complicated scatter plot uh, right at the end. Another thing you might have noticed I did there, which was a bit subtle, is just don't move your mouse. Try as a presenter to move your mouse as little as possible. Uh, it's hard work following everyone's mouse cursor. If you want to show a tooltip, put move the mouse to the tooltip, take your hands off the mouse, and describe what the tooltip is showing. I don't need to see this, right? Because none of you are now seeing anything. Look at all the data I've got. I've got countries and continents and things. No, just move your mouse, take your hand off, tell me what the tooltip sells, says, and I can infer what the rest of the data looks like. So animation, parameters, calculations can really help build a great story. And, Mark, and Jonathan talked a little bit about that earlier. Oh, let's get back to moving on. Some general tips. I realize that some of you don't have time to invest or don't have the time to make the slides as good as you possibly can. I realize we're very busy. It somehow seems that in lockdown, we're all busier than we ever were. So there's, here's some quick tips if you are short of time. First of all, when you're presenting, don't leave any white space in your slide. Make the chart fill the screen. Even if like this, it's not a very good chart, at least I'll be able to see it. A way you can do this in Tableau is put the chart into a dashboard and make the dashboard 16 by nine. Or choose the drop down here, which says PowerPoint slide. Yes, you can make a dashboard size to PowerPoint. And then as you build the dashboard, it, you can sort of see how it's gonna look like in the slide. Tip number two, if you have a corporate template, do not do this. This is, this is the second of about three things that make me my blood boil. Do not copy and paste your chart over your corporate background because I'll tell you, it make, to me, it makes you look sloppy and lazy. Uh, just make the simple change and it tells me you have actually thought about me as an audience member. It's a small thing. In PowerPoint, right click, format the background, hide the graphics, and Andy's a happy guy. So I go, I go from cross to being happy. That's how easy it is to make me happy and all the rest of your audience too, I suspect. Finally, if you're trying to communicate a fairly simple data point and your chart is you know, not ideal, you know you've got a complicated chart and you don't have time to improve it uh, and you don't have time to present it, then you know what's a really good tip? Uh, stop sharing your screen, right? And then suddenly I'm gonna tell you, Lorna, we've had record attendees on this webinar. Jordan, feedback has been through the roof but your target for next month is 30% higher audience figures, right? And suddenly everyone's like, oh, right. It's a, it's, it's a slightly in your face way of presenting data, but take the screen away, look into your camera and you can tell anything, it's really powerful. But that's enough of me looking scarily into the camera. Uh, let me just go back to the screen. So if you have no time to improve it, we don't always need to see slides. Don't use slides as a, as a as a what's the word um crutch that's the word all right that that's kind of it so let's summarize and then we'll go to some q a in fact look at this i'm ahead of time summary we share many different types of charts in this short talk i've just talked about dashboards we're communicating complicated pieces of information designed for sort of personal slow consumption when you put these things on a big screen and nobody knows where they're supposed to be looking so think about how you're gonna use uh, multiple techniques to draw the attention to the dashboard as and when they need to look at any particular part of the screen. Secondly, we're using charts to persuade and inform. And these can be complex or simple charts, but again, your audience does not know what they're looking at. So think, how are you gonna build the chart and build the slides such that by the time the full chart is on the screen, they know what they're looking at. So this presentation is part, part, this short presentation is part of a much bigger set of content I do called Clear and Presentation Danger, where I go into uh, much more detail about how to demo Tableau, um, chart design, chart choice. But at the, and you, we, uh, there'll be links to go find those resources. At the most fundamental, I have spent a long and great career looking at data and I have seen data presented brilliantly and I have seen data presented really poorly. And I think it's incumbent on us all 
as analysts to really take that step back at every interaction we do on a screen. Think, is the audience able to follow what I'm doing? And it's amazing when you take that step back and think, oh, maybe they're not. And I'm sure some of you have watched this, even in this presentation and thought, I didn't follow what Andy was doing then. So the other thing I empower everybody on this presentation to do, and I, this is, I take this really seriously, is you should feel confident in giving constructive criticism to your peers about presentations. Because presenting is quite an intimidating thing to do for a lot of people, right? But it's also something I fear we, we are reluctant to give constructive feedback about because it's like, hey, Andy's presenting. I can't, I can't tell him he could be better because I don't want to upset him, right? It's incumbent on us all to tell our peers when they're presenting data and you're thinking, oh, I didn't really follow you there, Andy. Uh, so feel free to tell me what you think I've done wrong in this presentation. Uh, I also say, feel free to approach your colleagues and say, I didn't really follow that. Particularly if you're going to customers and showing work, because if you're self-employed and a freelancer, you've got to get this right. It's going to differentiate you from all your, uh, all your competitors. So there you go. That is, gosh, a mere tw 15, 20 minute talk. Um, I'll take some questions now. Um, but please let me know what, let me know what you think. Uh, Lorna, do we have any questions I should address? Yeah, um, so there's one here. Um, it's not necessarily about presenting live, uh, but there's a question from Nal Mossop. Is there a way to best utilize the pointing and presentation tips into self-service dashboards that colleagues will use themselves? So without you having to present uh, yeah. it, is there anything that they can do? Yeah, so what I haven't done in this in this shortened version is I have a whole section on formatting data for or formatting and designing charts with the use of color and the use of font um, and the use of call outs and big, big numbers in ways in which you can make the data on the screen stand out. And actually, as I've done that, a lot of those it's, it's obvious a lot of those tips and techniques also apply to uh, the general dashboard design. I think you know, just one answer is, is just think so carefully about how you use color in a dashboard. If you want to design a really powerful dashboard, take away all the color, make it gray tone and use one color, right? A blue or a red and a gray dashboard looks so effectively and that constraint forces you to be creative. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think there is... Um... A few of the questions that we might not be able to answer live, uh, but they're in the Q&A. Um, there is one, um, one question from me actually is, camera on, camera off when you're presenting <laughs> from working from home? Uh, uh, camera on. I, I, camera. I think that I, I think these days we need, and I hope my camera is on, I haven't said that. I'm assuming it I is, yes. It. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, in fact, camera on and then stop sharing when the screen's no longer used. Right. Uh, you know, we're all in the we're all in lockdown and more than ever, we need face to face communication. And, and camera on is kind of the closest we can get to the real thing for now. But I would I would continue with camera on anyway. Um, I just think, you know, we're all we're all human beings. We could be come to life when the camera's on. Yep. Um, other things are, can you re repeat the mouse tip? So how you do the magnifier on tablet on this tablet screen and how you um, do the pointer on the actual mouse as well. And um, yes. Macs are slightly differently, by the way. Um, just a quick one on a Mac. Yeah, how do you if do you it do on a Mac? Option command eight or yep. option command equals. Ah, that's cool. And uh, yeah, so it's 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 setting up the control button on your. I can't find the slide, so uh, I'll just have to. Yeah, it, uh, if you go to mouse pointers, uh, your mouse pointer properties in your control panel on Windows, and change so that the control key put locates the cursor. So it's control key in the mouse pointers, and then the magnifier was done using this uh, Logitech presenter thing, which is a nice piece of hardware. Perfect. Um, your clear on presentation danger um, presentation is available online, isn't it? It is. Uh, if you go to gravyanecdote.com, there's a bunch of 
sh 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 blog post about that and the entire presentation is on YouTube in a few different, uh, from a few different conferences. Perfect. Okay. And I think uh, that's enough for the live questions. So thank you very much, Andy. That was My awesome. Um, next week's session is on the 16th of April if you're in PST time zone or the 17th of April if you're in AES, AEST. Uh, there'll be an update coming with a link and sign up in the next coming days. Please reach out to us if you want to present at any future sessions. Um, the recording will be made available in the next couple of days to watch back also along with the slides and the content. Um, I just want to thank um, all of today's speakers and organizers. It's been such a great turnout um, and hopefully we can continue this going forward. That's it for today. Um, join us next week. Stay safe and stay at home if you can. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.